Good evening, everyone. I welcome you to this evening's webinar entitled Eating Right, Healthful Foods for Healing Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease. This is a part of our webinar series for summer 2020, where we discuss how to deliver dietary therapy for various digestive disorders. Tonight's presenters are Dr. John Clark and Ms. Elaine Hahn. Dr. Clark is the head of the esophageal group in our digestive health center who has worked with Ms. Han to deliver care, uh, tell patients what to eat, what not to eat to help with reflux disease. I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Clark now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Uh, my name is John Clark and it's my pleasure to present the first half of uh, this webinar on helpful foods for healing GERD. And during the next 20 minutes, uh, I'm going to cover what is gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, why is GERD important, why do people get GERD, how do we diagnose GERD, how do we treat GERD, and when should you seek help for GERD. So to start off, what is GERD? Well, gastroesophageal reflux occurs when acid that is normally in the stomach goes up into the esophagus. And Typically when you eat, things are chewed in the mouth, they go down the esophagus, and they usually pass through that area in about eight seconds. And then they enter the stomach, and they can sit in the stomach for hours and get broken down. And uh, one thing the body does is it makes gastric acid that then helps to start the process of breaking food down. And sometimes that acid can come back in the esophagus. Now, that's something that happens to everyone at some point throughout the day. Um, most times if we look and we measure the acid in the esophagus, people who are normal, who are healthy, who don't necessarily have symptoms, can have acid in the esophagus up to 4% of the time, but may not feel symptoms with it. And so gastroesophageal reflux is reasonably common, uh, but we call something gastroesophageal reflux disease when that reflux either causes bothersome symptoms or else damage. And typically, if we look at the symptoms that we can experience with GERD, there's typical symptoms such as heartburn and acid regurgitation. Um, but then there's also a number of atypical symptoms such as chest pain, uh, difficulty swallowing, cough, sore throat, voice changes, uh, nausea, or um, else stomach discomfort. Why is GERD important? Well, 20% of U.S. adults will experience symptoms of GERD at least once a week. 60% will have symptoms at least once a year. And the rates of GERD and the severity of GERD are directly linked to obesity. If you look at the economic cost of GERD, just in the U.S. alone, the annual direct cost of treatment is currently greater than $15 billion. Now, I said that GERD was linked with obesity. And for the next few, few slides, I'd like to, to draw you through a map of the uh, USA that's color-coded based on body weight, starting in 1990, and then we're going to go up through what estimates will look like in 2030. And you can see that as a country in 1990, we were reasonably lean. So uh, there was no state in the entire union where greater than 15% of the population was considered to be, um, uh, at that point, um, obese. Now, you can see that as we go throughout the next 30 years, uh, that we as a country are getting heavier and heavier. By 2015, there's not a single state in the entire country that now has a rate of obesity of less than 20%. And there's recently been estimates as to what we're going to look like in 2030 if we continue upon this current trend. And the bottom line is that we as a country are getting heavier. And not surprisingly, reflux is becoming more common in this scenario. Now, in addition to symptoms, reflux can also be associated with health consequences. And so we tend to worry about damage within the lining of the esophagus, which we refer to as esophagitis, hemorrhage or bleeding, uh, strictures, uh, Barrett's esophagus, which is where the uh, lining of the esophagus becomes injured, and then it heals looking like a different type than what it was before, and that carries a risk of cancer. Currently, esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is the cancer that we see with reflux, 
is the sixth lead in cause of cancer death in, in the US and also the fastest growing cancer in white men past the age of 50. Now, why do people get GERD? Well, GERD can occur from multiple possible causes. And in most people, it's usually not as simple as one cause. It's usually a few of these in combination. So you could have a lower esophageal sphincter that increases and um, opens more often than normal, which uh, let things up. You could have a weak sphincter. You um, could have a hernia, which means that there's a separation between the diaphragm and the uh, junction of the stomach and the esophagus. You could have increased abdominal pressure, which is often secondary to obesity, where there's just more pressure pushing things back up in the chest. There could be weak muscles in the esophagus so that when things do reflux in the esophagus, maybe they don't get pushed down as quickly. There could be decreased saliva so that there's less buffering of what comes up. There could be sensitive nerves where perhaps the amount of acid is only minimally elevated, but that sensation is much more so than what's typical. There could be factors related to uh, family history which contribute. Certainly a number of the medications that are used for other conditions can also increase the risk of reflux as well. And there's multiple other factors which are at play that we're still learning. How do we diagnose GERD? Well, typically the first step in making a diagnosis is symptoms. And so if someone presents with typical symptoms in the right context, we're often very comfortable in assuming that this is reflux and then treating appropriately. Also, there's also a response towards medical therapy. So if acid induces symptoms, then treatment that blocks the acid can be both diagnostic as well as therapeutic. However, if we find that we're not sure of the diagnosis despite those measures, then we typically will step back and look at diagnostic testing. And when we do testing, we typically have four goals. One is to see if there's damage from um, acid. Two is to see if there's higher amounts of acid or non-acid reflux than what's typical. Third is to see when symptoms occur, does it correspond with um, acid or non-acid events? And then fourth is to exclude other conditions that could mimic reflux. Now we have a number of diagnostic tests that are at our disposal. And I'll say up front that Usually, again, we do treat before we test in most people if symptoms are typical and there's no alarm findings. But for those people that do require additional testing, we have a number of options available. Our first step is typically endoscopy. And this is where we take a long, thin tube with a camera on the end look from the mouth down and then take pictures within the esophagus and stomach. And this allows us to look to see if there's injury within the lining of the esophagus to make sure we're not missing some, something such as Barrett's and to exclude other conditions that could potentially cause or else mimic GERD. And typically if we do endoscopy in people who have reflux symptoms, we generally will find some finding in about 10% of those people. But most people, the endoscopy looks normal. Uh, barium studies are where uh, one drinks a white chalky material and we take x-rays looking at the esophagus. This is not terribly sensitive for a reflux esophagitis, but it can be very helpful at detecting structural changes such as hernias. Uh, capsule endoscopy is something that I, I mentioned because patients do ask me about it. Um, this is where you take a capsule that has two cameras on, swallow it, and it takes pictures throughout the esophagus. At present, this is not as sensitive as doing endoscopy and it's quite expensive. Um, capsule endoscopy does have a large role to play in looking at the small bowel, but in the esophagus, um, it's best used at this point within clinical trials. But that's not to say that'll be the case in 10 or 15 years if uh, this is cheaper and readily available. Typically though, if one has symptoms of GERD uh, that have been refractory to diet, lifestyle, or medications, and they've had endoscopy that doesn't show reflux damage, then if we do additional testing, our next step is typically to measure the acid or else non-acid fluid and see if that corresponds with symptoms. We have two ways of doing that. The first way is with what's referred to as wireless pH testing, where uh, during endoscopy, we take a very small probe uh, 
attach that against the wall of the esophagus. That probe then records for about 96 hours and it can tell us what's going on in terms of the acid exposure. Or we can do what's called combined pH impedance testing where we take a, a thin tube and place it from the nose down um, towards just above the stomach. That tube stays in place for uh, 24 hours and has sensors that looks at both acid and non-acid fluid. And then finally, there's a, a new test that was just FDA approved, referred to as mucosal impedance testing, which can be done during endoscopy. These are some of the images that we can see during endoscopy. On your left-hand side, you're seeing a patient with esophagitis with an ulcer that's present. And on your right-hand side, you're uh, seeing a patient with Barrett's esophagus. These are findings that we can see with endoscopy, which would change what we do in terms of therapy. This is what we can see with a, a wireless pH test. On the left-hand side, you're seeing wireless pH testing with the probe in place. And this is what it looks like in the esophagus. Notice there's no wires, there's no catheters. This probe is uh, telemetrically sending the pH every six seconds to a small recorder, which the patient carries, which they then drop off 96 hours later. The probe itself will fall off typically about seven to 10 days afterwards. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the information that we get from this. And this allows us to look at the acid during a 96 hour period, as well as to look and see if there's any correlation between acid and symptoms. This is combined pH impedance testing, which is a catheter-based study. Uh, so it is a little more, more um, awkward from the patient's standpoint, but it does look at both acid and non-acid fluid. Um, but you know, once again, it is a little more awkward. And uh, speaking from uh, personal experience, this is me on the left back in 2006 uh, when I had a little more hair getting the study done. And then finally, this is mucosal impedance. This was just FDA approved last year, um, but this is a test that can be done during endoscopy in real time where you can look at the lining of the esophagus and there's data that suggests that the findings you can get from this real time recording uh, may correspond well with the 24 hour pH impedance results. This is still a relatively new test and we're still figuring where this fits in our pathway, um, but we do expect that we'll be seeing more of this in years to come. Now, let's turn at this point towards treatment. How do we treat GERD and what are our goals? And typically when we're treating reflux, we have three goals with therapy. One is to improve quality of life. Two is to make symptoms disappear or at least improve significantly. And then three is to heal any damage which is present and then prevent any additional damage. And we have a number of options which are available to treat, which I'm going to go through in series. But the first step is typically uh, diet and lifestyle modification. And because Elaine will, will be doing her talk entirely on this, I'm going to spend just a small amount of time on this slide. But I do want to emphasize that because GERD is such a common condition, uh, and because there are risks to any medical therapy which is done, that diet and uh, lifestyle modification are always the, the first line therapy to treat GERD. And in many patients, um, this is the only therapy which is required. Now there's a number of different diet and lifestyle modifications that are in the literature and on websites. And once again, Elaine is gonna go through this in much more depth than, than I will hear. But on this one slide, I've summarized my main um, avenues of therapy in terms of um, diet and lifestyle. And the ones that I really focus on are weight loss, if that's a factor, with a goal of losing between five to 10% of body weight. Avoidance of trigger foods if they're identified. And there's a long list of foods that can make GERD worse in some people. Um, but I don't think that everyone needs to cut out all foods from this list unless they have symptoms from those foods. Um, small meal size, so small uh, low-fat meals can help. If there's nighttime symptoms, avoiding meals within three hours of lying down. Uh, raising the head of the bed. Um, with the idea there that then hopefully uh, the uh, benefit of gravity will keep, keep things from going up at night. Um, and there, there is recent literature showing also that exercise can 
um, help as well. Um, there's a number of other things which are listed here, but once again, diet and lifestyle are really the, the, the key first steps, and this will be covered with a lens talk next. If people have symptoms despite diet and lifestyle, then our, our main next step is to try and block the acid production. And we have three general therapies that work through modification of gastric acid. The first one are antacids, which are um, um, supplements such as Tums. And these are generally magnesium, calcium, or else aluminum containing substances, which are available in the drugstores without a prescription, that buffer acid. And so these don't stop acid production, but they do neutralize the acid that they come into contact with. They can be useful in that they're very safe and they're very fast acting, um, but they're not tremendously effective and they're relatively short acting. Um, nevertheless, they are cheap, safe, and uh, work quickly. Typically, the next step are referred to as histamine receptor blockers. And histamine is one of three triggers of gastric acid within the stomach. And so these are more effective than the antacids. Um, they um, are quite safe, um, but generally they're slower acting. Um, they last for between four and six hours. And if you were to take them around the clock, then you end up getting resistance against them. They may not work as well, but they can be very helpful for people who have occasional breakthrough symptoms. Or if you know that you may have reflux with a clear trigger coming up, you could potentially preempt that by taking this beforehand. Uh, and then finally, the proton pump inhibitors, or uh, PPIs as they're known as, are at this point the medical mainstay of reflux therapy within the US. These work by blocking uh, gastric acid production within the stomach. They block the end state of gastric acid production. So there is no resistance against them with time. Um, they are much more effective than both the antacids as well as the um, H2 receptor blockers, but they are slower acting and um, they are much more expensive. Now, if people have GERD symptoms that have not responded to diet, lifestyle, and basic meds to try and block acid, then we do have a number of um, other options which are available. There are a number of other medications that have been looked at. Uh, recently, there's been a resurgence of interest in what's referred to as alginates, which are seaweed derivatives that um, thicken gastric fluid so that you may not reflux as high as you otherwise would. Uh, prokinetics are medications that increase stomach emptying and may help improve GERD as well. Uh, GABA is a chemical that's on the end of some nerves um, that has been shown to increase sphincter pressure in the lower esophagus. And this may help to decrease reflux without necessarily affecting the acid. Uh, serotonin is a chemical that can be expressed within the stomach. Medications that affect one specific subtype of serotonin may allow the stomach to expand more before fluid refluxes back up. And finally, we have a whole category of medications which affect the nerves and make them less sensitive. There's also some literature looking at uh, complementary therapy as well. Uh, there's been some recent in interest in prebiotics um, with the idea that modifying the gut bacteria may help to form a uh, microbiome environment where there's less acid production. Uh, and there was a nice trial about a decade ago that showed that in people who have reflux symptoms despite a PPI, that there was a uh, benefit towards adding sessions of acupuncture. And then there's always a, um, a number of clinical trials which are enrolling. Um, we, um, we are actually enrolling at present for a trial looking at a bile acid sequestrant at Stanford. And if anyone is interested in that, please uh, reach out and let us know. If uh, medical therapy, diet, and lifestyle has been unsuccessful and symptoms are debilitating enough that more aggressive therapy is needed, then often the next step is to do something mechanical, and that could be with endoscopy or with surgery. There are two options that are FDA approved to treat GERD with endoscopy. The first is Streta, which is on the left side of the screen. This has been FDA approved for about 20 years. And um, during uh, this procedure, uh, a, a very careful burn is made at the bottom section of the esophagus to try and stiffen the sphincter uh, in the hopes that this will um, 
keep fluid from um, coming back up as often. On the right hand side, you see what's referred to as an endoscopic uh, plication, which is also referred to as the TIF procedure, where a special endoscope is inserted within the stomach. And then using the endoscope, uh, the goal is to try and cinch the um, junction of the stomach the esophagus and make it more tight to form more of a barrier against acid coming back up. Now, while I did mention the two endoscopic therapies, which are FDA approved, I want to emphasize that um, when people get to this stage of the pathway where they're looking to do some mechanical option, the surgery is really the mainstay of therapy and is performed much more commonly than the endoscopic therapies I've talked about. And there are two main types of operations which are offered for people with uh, GERD plus normal weight. Uh, the first one you see on the left-hand side is referred to as a fundoplication, and there's a number of different variants of that, Nissen being uh, most common within the U.S. And during this procedure, the surgeon will wrap part of the stomach around the junction of the stomach and the esophagus to make it more tight. On the right-hand side, you see what's referred to as the Lynx procedure. This is where a series of uh, magnetic bracelets are placed around the outside of the esophagus to try and make it more tight. For those people with GERD, who are uh, significantly overweight, uh, gastric bypass may actually be a better procedure. Now, when should you seek help for GERD? And for most people who have GERD, if you have typical symptoms and your symptoms respond to diet and lifestyle or intermittent use of medications, then you may not need to seek medical attention for this. Um, but if you have atypical symptoms, so if you have problems swallowing, if you have no appetite or weight loss, chest pain, choking sensation, bleeding, then it's worthwhile to seek medical attention because you'd hate to miss um, something else be besides GERD. Um, if your GERD symptoms are new onset and you're older, uh, then once again, it's, it's good to have that looked at and make sure that, that you're um, not missing anything more serious. If you're not responding towards diet and lifestyle modification or basic medical therapy, uh, then it's worthwhile to seek medical attention, both to uh, make sure you've got the right diagnosis, as well as to try and find therapy that works. If you've had reflux for a very long period of time, then it might be worthwhile doing at least one endoscopy to make sure that you don't have Barrett's or any complications from GERD. Or if you have um, any um, uh, uh, history in your family of any reflux associated um, uh, complications, uh, then once again, it's good to seek medical attention. So take home points, GERD is relatively common, and has a good prognosis, uh, but complications can occur. Most people will not need to pursue testing for GERD and will respond to uh, treatment. Diet and lifestyle are almost always the first line approach and are the safest long-term option. While we do have multiple medications which are available, there is a risk with every medical therapy that's employed. Diet and lifestyle don't necessarily carry that. They're always the safest option. If symptoms are atypical or do not improve, then we have a number of tests and we have a number of other therapies which we can employ when needed. Um, so with that, I will stop here. It's been, uh, it's been nice talking to you. I appreciate the attention. I will be in the question and answer session and look forward to talking with, with you more then. It's my pleasure um, to, to introduce Elaine, um, who is going to um, take the second half of um, this webinar and we'll talk about the um, dietary approaches towards GERD. Uh, thank you once again, and I'll see you in the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. My name is Elaine, and I'm one of the dietitians in the Digestive Health Clinic at Stanford. I'm excited to talk to you now about nutrition and lifestyle recommendations as it relates to GERD. So I'll begin by talking about weight loss strategies, if you have any excess weight to lose. Then I'll go ahead and talk about potential malabsorption of nutrients if you are on a proton pump inhibitor. And then I'll go ahead and discuss macronutrients as it relates to GERD. And we'll talk about common food triggers. And then of course, we'll talk about lifestyle interventions. So epidemiologic studies strongly suggest that the prevalence of GERD is increasing and the major contributing factor to this trend is the rising prevalence of obesity. 
The American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy identifies obesity as the leading cause of frequent heartburn. Weight loss is beneficial for those who have excess weight. Extra weight puts pressure on the lower esophageal sphincter, and this is weakened over time by this pressure and eventually stops functioning properly, resulting in chronic reflux or GERD. So here I want to show you a map um, put out by the CDC. This was um, for the year 2011. The map has different colors indicating the obesity, the percentage of obesity in each state. The color green represents less than 25% obesity. The color yellow represents less than 30% obesity. The color orange represents less than 35% obesity. And the color red, which you don't see here, is um, representing greater than 35% um, obesity in all of the US. This data comes from the Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is an ongoing state-based telephone interview survey conducted by the CDC and state health departments. Now I'm gonna go ahead and show you um, the map, which is um, in 2018, which is the most recent data released by the CDC. Over time, as you can see here, the, prevalen the prevalence of obesity has increased. You can see that there's less green compared to before, which was, this is in 2011, and this is now in 2018. There's more of the color red and the color orange, which indicates that there's more than 35% obesity now. So you can see how there's a difference between 2011 and then now 2018. What can you do to lose weight if you have excess weight to lose? Number one, something I would recommend is not skipping meals. Um, try to be consistent with meal time so you don't end up having one large meal in the evening, which can potentially result in metabolic changes. Um, focus on quality food and not quantity. Food quality can influence how satisfying your food is, which influences how much you end up eating in the long run. Consider mindful eating. Mindful eating meaning don't rush, enjoy the experience, avoid any distractions like TV or even going on your phone, sitting at a table and just not over the kitchen sink, um, enjoying what you're eating and also drinking more water. Exercise is another one. You can see a mother and her daughter right here exercising. There are many great benefits to physical activity. Um, one of them includes helping with weight loss, but it also improves your mental health and mood. And boy, do we know it's hard to be at home right now, and it's been going on for more than six months. So sneak in some movement um, into your routine. So even if we're mostly homebound, you can sneak some time in by um, doing um, house chores. And house chores, you know, just also being that... Um, uh, scrubbing, sweeping, vacuuming, dusting, um, making your bed. So <laughs> anything that you can do um, at a brisk pace can be counted as physical activity. Many of us are also watching more TV. So make the commercials count by adding in some more squats, jumping jacks, push-ups, lunges, um, or even doing these in between your Zoom meetings. So finding anything that you can do in terms of movement counts. The other thing that I want to talk about next is really about nutrients. So um, patients who have been on a proton pump inhibitor um, for a long period of time, there is a potential risk for nutrient deficiencies, um, mostly impacting vitamin B12, iron, magnesium, and calcium. Um, and that being said, vitamin B12 can be low, um, below due to gastric acid needing to release vitamin B12 from protein for absorption. Protein pump inhibitors can reduce the absorption of protein-bound vitamin B12. In regards to iron, iron can be low um, because non-heme iron requires gastric acid for conversion to the ferrous form for absorption. In regards to magnesium, proton pump inhibitors um, inhibits active transport of magnesium in the intestine. And in regards to calcium, calcium is primarily absorbed 
in its ionized form in the upper small intestine. Proton pump inhibitors can inhibit the release of ionized calcium, affecting intestinal absorption of calcium, and thus result in a negative calcium balance within the body. Um, but something I really want you to understand too is that most patients who do consume a balanced diet probably will not experience any significant nutrient deficiencies. But let's go ahead and talk next about food sources of calcium, magnesium, B12, and iron. So you can see here, um, salmon, trout, halibut, they are all great sources of vitamins B12, magnesium, and calcium. And then vegetables right here, like spinach, kale, collard greens, bok choy, and broccoli, they're all great sources of calcium, magnesium, and non-heme iron. So if you're trying to get more iron in vegetables, um, into your diet with vegetables, make sure that you do pair them with vitamin C rich foods for better absorption. Good examples are like squeezing lemon into your salad, like your spinach salad, um, or pairing sweet potatoes with lentils or quinoa. Um, over here, um, we have dairy and fortified non-dairy products. Those are great sources of calcium and vitamin B12. And then nuts and legumes, those are great sources of magnesium and iron. Right here um, is more of a detailed list of foods with the nutrients that we were discussing. Um, but like I mentioned before, most patients who do consume a balanced diet probably will not experience any significant nutrient deficiencies. Just try to make sure that you incorporate all whole foods um, as best as you can. But next, I'm going to discuss the specifics of food and the relationships of macronutrients, such as carbs, fats, and protein, and how that relates to GERD. So now let's talk about carbohydrates. Um, carbohydrate is a potential mediator of reflux symptoms. Monosaccharides, which are simple sugars, have been linked to increased GERD symptoms, whereas fiber, which comes from complex carbohydrates, have been linked to decreased GERD symptoms. So when choosing carbohydrates, I want you to focus on complex carbs. Um, such as fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, as you can see here on the left picture. It takes your body a lot longer to digest these carbohydrates and provide energy for longer periods of time. They have vitamins and minerals and other micronutrients um, that's good for your body. Simple carbs, um, which are the refined carbohydrates that you can see here on the right side, um, such as cookies, baked goods, um, any white flour products are considered simple because they're easier to digest and they don't offer any vitamins or mineral benefits. So why should we focus on complex carbohydrates? Well, complex carbohydrates have fiber in it and there are well-known benefits to fiber. Um, the process of digesting fiber may lead to smooth muscle relaxation from the stomach to the esophagus, essentially tightening the anti-reflux valve. Fiber-rich foods help eliminate food faster and remove toxins from the body, spending a shorter amount of time in the intestinal tract, which can prevent GI issues that lead to acid reflux. So what types of food have fiber in it? You can see here in this picture, um, any plant-based foods, um, things that kind of grow from the earth, like grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes. So all of this right here. Um, the USDA recommends 21 to 25 grams of fiber for women, 30 to 38 grams of fiber for men. So some ways that you can incorporate more fiber into your routine is adding vegetables to your omelet, adding dried beans and peas to your soups, adding nuts, seeds, and fruit to plain yogurt or oatmeal, um, making a chili with different types of beans and vegetables, adding berries, nuts, and seeds to salads. So um, some easy ways that you can start adding more fiber to your routine. 
Um, now, I want to talk more about um, the next macronutrient, fat, and how that plays a role in, um, in the symptoms of GERD. So with fat, fat delays stomach emptying. Um, the longer that the food stays in your stomach, more acid is made to help with digestion. So digestion often requires secretion of potential esophageal irritants and neurohormonal mediators of the lower esophageal sphincter tone. Several population studies have favored correlation of fat intake with GERD symptoms, but there are some confounding factors um, which include total caloric intake and um, BMI of study participants. But so really the link between fat and acid reflux is not entirely clear, but the bottom line is that foods high in fat can also contribute to high calories, which may cause weight gain. And as we mentioned before, excess weight can lead to a greater risk for acid reflux. So choosing um, the, the best types of fat, we wanna choose less saturated fats, um, which includes butter, fat from meats and meat products, whole milk products, egg yolks, and lard. Really what you wanna focus more on are unsaturated fats, which includes vegetable oil, olive oil, canola oil, sunflower oils, avocados, nuts, seeds, and fatty fish, which includes salmon, mackerel, herring, and trout. So how do we make a better swap or making a better choice to choosing healthier fats? So instead of sauteing your vegetables and butter, um, choose olive oil or canola oil um, instead of using butter or lard. Choose lean cuts of meat, um, which can also include like chicken breast, or if you're eating some poultry, make sure you take the skin off of the meat. Um, cook fish um, twice a week, um, like salmon or tuna or mackerel, um, twice a week in place of meat. Um, and in terms of nice um, snacks, snack options, you can choose having fruits and vegetables um, as good healthy snacks. So now let's discuss the next macronutrient. I want to talk a little bit about protein and how that relates to GERD. So protein may help strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter over time or help in the healing of irritated mucosa or ulcers. Um, early research linked protein intake with increase in lower esophageal sphincter pressures by allowing the closure of the sphincter and reducing reflux. So I recommend choosing lean protein with less saturated fat. Some good examples are salmon, chicken breast, tenderloin steak, tuna steak, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, mozzarella, eggs, kidney beans, green peas, lentils, and chickpeas. So these are all great sources of protein and you know, it doesn't have to be all animal-based. You have some great plant-based protein as well. Now that you know what types of food to eat, it's also important to understand that timing and the amount of food plays a role in um, potential symptoms of GERD. Um, generally, it's recommended to avoid eating three hours before bedtime. Typically, it can take up to four hours for 90% of a solid meal to move forward out of the stomach. And there is increased gastric acid secretion with food intake, as well as a physical presence of food in the stomach when the person is laying on their back. So let's talk a little bit about portion sizes because the amount of food that you eat absolutely can play a role in acid reflux. So really watch your portion size. When I'm talking about that, um, I just want to mention that larger meals take longer to empty from your stomach and may apply extra pressure on the valve between the stomach and the esophagus. So when I'm talking about portion sizes and portion control, I like to recommend um, using a nine inch plate and making half of your plate like lean um, uh, green leafy vegetables um, or just non-starchy vegetables. And then making the other quarter of your plate right here, lean protein, um, which are like chicken, fish, pork, eggs, turkey, and everything I just mentioned earlier as well. 
the other quarter of the plate could would be whole grains. So um, that could include brown rice, quinoa, sweet potatoes, whole wheat pasta, or whole grain bread. Okay. So now um, I want to talk a little bit about food and beverages. Just be conscious of which types of food and beverages seem to agitate your symptoms the most and monitor your consumption of them. It may help to food journal to identify your food triggers. Not all triggers and treatments will affect people in the same way. So keep in mind that when you eat, like the timing of your food may just be as important as what you eat. So if you are food journaling, it might be important for you to also note the timing of your meal and your symptoms. Um, common food um, and beverage triggers are coffee, tea, alcohol, or carbonated beverages, spicy foods, and other foods such as citrus fruits, tomatoes, garlic, onions, peppermint, or chocolate. These food may cause irritation to the esophageal mucosa, but have not been found to cause reflux themselves. So now let's talk a little bit about lifestyle interventions. The first thing um, that comes to mind is wearing loose fitting clothes. Avoid tight clothes, which are like belts, tight pants, hoisery like um, Spanx, as it can increase pressure in your abdominal area. And I think since most of us are working from home nowadays, um, wearing loose fitting pants and clothes is more the norm. So goodbye jeans and goodbye tight pants. <laughs> um, elevate the head of bed. So you can use a styrofoam wedge under the head of your mattress. Um, that's something that you might have heard of already. Um, also, sleeping on the left side of your body might um, be helpful because your esophagus slightly curves, so sleeping on your left side makes the angle sharper, limiting the flow of stomach acid into your esophagus. Um, also, if you smoke, um, consider um, to quit smoking. And also, during this time with the pandemic, you may find yourself going through more stress. Um, if that's the case, try to find a way to help manage your stress. You can consider taking like a 10 minute walk, learn and practice relaxation techniques such as yoga, meditation, tai chi, anything else that you can think of. Make time to rest um, and seek social or professional support to help you. Overall, the best ways to manage your GERD symptoms, um, I want to really emphasize the fact that how you should eat is really individualized based on your own individual symptoms. But weight loss is the strongest recommended treatment from the American College of Gastroenterology um, for any person with excess weight. Try your best to eat a balanced meal, like we mentioned earlier um, about the different macronutrients, the carbs, fat, and protein. Incorporate vegetables, lean protein, and whole grains um, because each of these macronutrients play a role in GERD symptoms. Consider food journaling so to better understand if you do have any food triggers. And this can also help better determine if you are getting adequate carbohydrates, fat, and protein, and vitamins. If you end up eliminating specific foods, see if you can reintroduce these foods back in gradually, um, and maybe starting with a smaller amount to just check your tolerance. And again, um, avoid late night eating. Stop eating three hours before bedtime. If you have any specific questions regarding nutrition, um, work with a registered dietitian with an expertise in GERD if you have any specific nutrition questions. This concludes the presentation portion on helping foods for healing GERD. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us for this webinar. This is going to take us into the Q&A portion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. Clark, this is Cassie. I have a couple of questions and I can start with you if that's all right. Sounds good, sounds good. Thanks, Cassie. All right, sure. The first question is, I've been taking 40 milligrams of Prilosec for at least 15 years. I'm 61 years old now and I've been experiencing a lot of bone degeneration in my neck. My mother has a history of osteoporosis. Is Prilosec the cause? 
Okay, that's a great question. And that, um, that question echoes something which was said in the, um, 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 the um, chat as well. Uh, there's there's been a lot of questions about the potential risks associated with with uh, therapy with GIs, and I'll try and go go through that reasonably quickly. Um, you can look at these meds as glass half empty, half full. I think the um, the half full approach of these meds are that they've been FDA approved since 1990. They were in clinical trials several years prior to that. The use of them within the U.S. is massive, and so it's estimated that uh, the sales in the states per year are uh, greater than 15 billion. Um, two of the five top selling brand name drugs in the country are in this category and 20% of adults in Europe are on them. So we have a, a, a lot of long term safety literature. I think anything that's negative about the PPIs gets a lot of media attention because there's so many people potentially affected. And if you look at the risks that are often supposed to be from the PEPIs. There's very little conclusively proven despite the massive use. Um, now with regards to um, osteoporosis specifically, um, that, uh, that, that first was raised in a paper in 2006 that, looks, that looked at hip fractures. And they noted within a rehab unit that more people who had a hip, a, um, hip fracture than they, uh, they thought was due just to chance were taking a PPI. And that raised the question of whether the PPIs could potentially affect the bone. Um, now to, to, add, to, to make it a, a little more plausible, we do know the P, P, that, that a PPI slightly decreased calcium absorption, gastrin is increased and B12 is slightly down, all of which can um, lead towards bone issues. That led to a number of different studies, uh, some of which said yes and some no. There was a, a systematic review that tried to look at everything together. And in their series, there was an increased risk of osteoporosis if you took a PPI, but the odds ratio was 1.2, which is very low for these types of studies. And they commented that the studies that they felt were better designed were not associated with, with uh, risk. The studies that they felt were worse were. The largest series that's looked at this to date was the Framingham Nurses Health Group. And in their series, there was no association between osteoporosis and PPI use. Um, so to, to kind of put this together, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say for sure if there is or is not a link because the data is not consistent. But if there is a link, it appears to be very modest. And I think one of the confusing factors here is that osteoporosis is so common um, that it's often hard to separate is it the medications or is it everything else that's that's going on but if there is a link it 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 seems very modest at best great one more question for you dr clark do certain medications cause or exacerbate your birth yes so um Great question. And there's a lot of different factors that can cause GERD. And so any medications are gonna slow stomach emptying that are going to um, um, cause the, uh, the, the sphincter that separates the stomach and the esophagus to drop in pressure or are going to decrease saliva can make GERD worse. And so anything such as opiates, for instance, which, which has a, a pretty profound effect of effect upon stomach emptying will make it worse. If there is um, meds that we often use to, to treat pain um, can, can often slow the, um, the gut as well. Some of the asthma medications and heart medications, which are used to try and relax the muscles within the lungs and blood vessels can also relax sphincter pressure. And some of the meds that um, dry out saliva as well can, can uh, make it worse. So there's probably about 30 to 40 meds, which have a you know, mild effect upon GERD. And it looks like you're on mute, Cassie. So we've got some. So, um, hi, Dr. Clark. Okay. Um, I think Cassie is um, having a little difficulty. I can ask the next question um, and I'll, I'll answer it. Um, there was a question that came in asking if there should be any um, 
B vitamins um, supplements if taking a proton pump inhibitor. Um, and like I mentioned in the presentation a little earlier, supplements are not always required or needed um, as long as you have a good appetite and you eat a variety of foods. Um, if you have been on a proton pump inhibitor for an extended amount of time, long term, um, and you are of elderly age and you just don't have a good appetite and not eating a variety, um, you can consider getting your lab work done and getting that checked out. But right now there's no guidelines that say that, uh, that you need to take a proton, um, that you need to take a supplement. Oftentimes you can get a lot of your B vitamins from really common foods like fish, salmon, trout, um, meat, dairy products, um, eggs, and also you can also get it from any fortified foods like fortified breakfast cereals or fortified um, non-dairy products. So those are all good um, sources and really supplements are um, not necessarily recommended if you're able to. If you're able to. Is Cassie able to Cassie ask Cassie the next question? I am here. I have one more question for you. Um, I used to love spicy food. The last few years, even the slightest hint of spice leads to reflux. Is there anything I can do to minimize that so I can enjoy my favorite food again? <laughs> That's a really good question. I like Indian and Mexican food too. Um, traditionally, it has been um, advised to avoid spicy foods or certain types of spices, but what we are learning now is that this is really based on um, on each individual. So like how much you're having or the portion size can also be a main factor. Um, so that's something you'll have to experiment with. So when it comes to like Mexican food, um, the challenging food that the food that can be challenging would be like the salsa because of the, the tomatoes, the raw um, onions, the raw garlic. So you might be able to actually tolerate about like a tablespoon or two. Um, I just wouldn't suggest doing like a whole cup full when you're doing um, your chips and salsa. Um, also with Mexican food, like what's common are, um, is avocado or guacamole. So I would probably stick to the more simpler form like the avocado because it's a healthy type of fat. It also has fiber. Um, guacamole might be challenging just because you do have the raw, the raw, um, the raw garlic uh, or onions or the tomatoes in there. So like I said, you can try a little bit or else um, just keep it simple with having just the um, avocados. When it comes to Indian food, because I know that was something you just mentioned too, um, some of the spices you might still be able to tolerate, such as cumin, uh, fennel, ginger, cloves, those do have some sort of digestive benefits. And then when it comes to the creamy sauces, I would recommend like the low fat yogurt for the sauces. Yeah, I guess one, one, one thing to add with that as well, it's interesting, pepper, um, may not make the reflux itself worse, but it can increase the sensation within the esophagus. And so um, there, there is actually an interesting line of thought that gradually increasing your pepper intake may improve reflux by desensitizing the nerves that's there. And there, there was a study that was done probably about a decade ago where they gave people cayenne red pepper and they gradually increased the dose within a 21 day period. And symptoms are actually better at the end of the study than the start. There's also a, 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 a more of an observation that in countries that have more spicy food at baseline, they also tend to have less GERD, GERD symptoms. So it, it does seem that pepper in the short term, obviously worse in terms of uh, making the esophagus more sensitive, but long-term chronic ingestion of pepper may actually be somewhat beneficial. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for adding to that. I, something else I want to say too, um, kind of like the big overall picture when it comes to food, um, don't avoid all these foods that might be like on a trigger list um, if you haven't experienced the symptoms yourself because everyone's tolerance is a little bit different. Um, so I, I really want to make sure it's more of a focus on, um, you know, what can you tolerate versus like just avoiding foods that you've seen on a list because um, you're, you're worried about it.
great. Dr. Clark, is there a relationship between esophageal spasms and GERD? Yes, so um, spasm of the esophagus is one of those things that's commonly hypothesized. It's actually a little bit more difficult to, to prove than you'd think it would, would be. But there is a thought that for those people that have spasm, two thirds of the time it's secondary to GERD. And the idea is that the, the GERD is essentially inducing a, a mild inflammatory response that makes the muscles more sensitive in that area. Um, it, it does seem that if people have spas, spasm, there are at least some studies that show that if you treat for GERD aggressively in that situation, the spasm gets better. That being said, not every spas, spasm is secondary to GERD, but about two thirds of them are. Great. Have you ever used melatonin to help patients with GERD? So great question, actually. Melatonin is, um, you know, it's, it's used as a sleep aid. And there are some studies that suggest that because it affects a, a specific access of stress response, that it may help in terms of gut motility and sensation. Um, I don't use it for GERD per se, but there are at least four studies that have looked at it with irritable bowel. And generally they've used doses of three or six at night for a period of eight to um, 12 weeks. And all four of them have, have, have uh, reported um, some improvement. Um, the thought at least is that it's probably affecting GI sensation. So that same benefit, which would last, which, which would work with irritable bowel might also work with GERD, but you know, to my knowledge, it hasn't been studied specifically with that. Um, there is also a link between uh, GERD plus irritable bowel. And so if you have a, um, a um, history of irritable bowel, your odds ratio of getting GERD is about seven times more, more and uh, vice versa. So a lot of the same mechanisms probably apply. Wonderful, thank you. Elaine, does chewing gum or practicing yoga help control GERD symptoms? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, chewing gum, um, I think someone mentioned this earlier in one of the questions too. Um, when we swallow excess air, which um, is brought in, um, which brings in a form of gas in our body, it can cause you to burp um, and so, chewing gum can naturally cause you to naturally swallow more air. And so, yeah, that might be able to help a little bit more. With yoga, that one's a little questionable. I, I really think that um, I do recommend exercising and breathing exercises, but um, doing something that's more um, horizontal might trigger some of the acid reflux. So I, I think that's kind of left up to um, each person to see how well you you tolerate. Um, there, there was a, something I wanted to say because Dr. Clark was mentioning a little bit about GERD and IBS and um, there was a question that someone had mentioned during the presentation that I wanted to address. Um, you know, it is possible to have more than one GI issue. So it's not like if you have GERD, you can't have another um, uh, digestive issue, um, unfortunately. So you can have more than one GI issues at a time, but what's important in regards to how you eat and what you eat, it's important to identify what types of symptoms that you do have. Um, when it comes to GERD, it does, the symptoms generally are more related to your upper GI tract. And with IBS, it's more related to your lower GI um, and also changes in your bowel movements. So when it comes to like how to eat and what to eat, I think it's really about symptom management because everyone has different types of symptoms. Um, so one thing that would also help your provider too, if you're working with your doctor or you're working with a dietitian, um, is food journaling and just really identifying what types of food you're eating how much you're having and also like what time of the day that you're feeling your symptoms because it's it's good to be aware to actually consider you know what else is happening through that time of the day um yeah
great. One more for Dr. Clark. How effective are Tums compared to traditional PPIs to treat GERD symptoms? Okay, so there, there was actually a study that looked at the relative efficacy of different therapies which are out there. And when they had looked at total symptom relief, the PEPIs as a class were about 90% effective. Um, histamine receptor blockers, which are things like Pepsid and Zantac, were about 40. And Tums in that category were about 10. So um, they, they won't be as effective as of the other medications that we've talked about. But the main benefit is that they work in seconds. The others take, take more. Um, safety is very, very good. Um, and if you do have you know, relatively mild symptoms and want something to work quickly, Tums is, is a very reasonable approach with that. Um, but it, it only buffers the acid it comes into contact with. Um, it won't necessarily stop production of acid. And it looks like we're 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 at time. Maybe we'll take a, a you know a few more questions and and then stop. We can go a couple minutes beyond. And I I saw one question about peppermint. So so maybe I'll I'll you know answer that um, just as we 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 end. You know, I think to, to, to echo what, what um, actually Elaine said with the last answer, the list of trigger foods really varies from person to person. So we don't typically recommend stopping everything just because it's on the list. And what can make it a little confusing is that different people get GERD from different causes and different people can have improvement and worsening from also different things. So um, peppermint is one example where uh, peppermint does um, lower the sphincter pressure between the esophagus and stomach, so it can make GERD worse, and it's often listed as one of the trigger foods. But peppermint can also expand the upper stomach, and so there are some people where if they um, take peppermint, their stomach can hold more food before they start to reflux up, and it may not make, make, make things worse and they actually improve it. Caffeine's another one where um, caffeine does um, make the sphincter open more often and lowers pressure. So it can certainly make GERD worse, but caffeine also accelerates gastric emptying. And so if people are getting GERD because they have slower stomach emptying, sometimes the caffeine actually helps instead of hurting. So it really does vary from person to person. And in terms of diet, you know, I think what, what we'd say is really focus upon doing a low fat, small portions, weight loss, if that's a factor. And then keep an eye on trigger foods. And if you find trigger foods, which, which you know, definitely are linked with it, cut them out. But we wouldn't cut everything out that's on the list just to cut it out unless you have symptoms with it. And I guess maybe since we're beyond time, maybe we'll, we'll stop here if that's okay with everybody. Okay. Thank you I so wanted much. to thank everyone. Thanks, <laughs> Lynn. Um, thank you all for, for um, joining, attending. Thank you, Cassie, uh, Shannon, Tani. And um, um, this has been, been, been great. And uh, we look forward to um, hopefully seeing you at future webinars down the road. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark and Elaine. We'll see you next time. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. It was wonderful.